Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Guy Kawasaki. I will tell you all about Guy in just a minute. Grace Under Pressure is that show that deals with what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment you exert toward others. And when you do it for a purpose of, from a leadership perspective, you do it to bring people together for common cause. Uh, and you will definitely discover that is something that Guy Kawasaki excels in. Welcome, Guy. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, yeah, sir. Thank you. I wait, let, let me, I, I'm just telling all my closest friends on LinkedIn to come listen to this, okay? okay. So if they search yeah. for your name, that's the best way? Yeah, John Baldoni. It's also it's also uh, it'll be later on the audio cast. So if okay. you listen now, and, and it's it's available on iTunes and all the other things. So we'll okay, I'm sending it to three million of my closest friends. <laughs> I, I'm I'm already in your debt, guy. Thank you. Um, anyway, this is fun for me because, guy, I have literally followed your work since your first book, and as we had a quick conversation beforehand. Um, you were working at Apple in the 80s, and I was doing a little tiny bit of marketing communication. So we, we didn't meet face to face, or at least not knowingly, but uh, we go way, way back, I guess. <laughs> so, anyway, and and look, we uh, we both have recovered from PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Folks, Guy Kawasaki, if you don't know, is the chief evangelist of Canva and host of the Remarkable People podcast, which has produced a new book called Think Remarkable, which we'll talk about. Uh, Guy has worked for all kinds of organizations. Uh, you have been a brand ambassador <laughs> for... <laughs> Are you saying I'm, I'm unstable? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, I'm not unstable. Uh, anyway, just a, a resource for all of us. So let's jump in. So you have been uh, an entrepreneur, uh, a brand evangelist, all these kinds of things. Why did you jump into doing podcasts of all things? So <laughs> now, there's there's two versions for this story. There's the graceful story, and there's the truth. Which one do you want first? Well, we'll do the truth, and we'll do the grace later. <laughs> okay. The truth is I was finishing my previous book called Wise Guy. So I was on this podcast and interview tour, and I, I meet with these podcasters, and I say to them, so what's a business model for a podcast? And they tell me, well, we have three ads, one at the beginning, one in the middle, one at the end. And I said, well, how much do you charge for those ads? He says, well, the first one is 25, the second one is 15, and the last one is 10. And I'm, I'm in my head, you know, I'm not a math major, but I can, I can add 25, 15, and 10 and get 50. And I said, so you make 50 grand a week and you do 52 weeks. And he said, well, actually, we do more than one a week. So we get more than two and a half million. And I said to myself, well, why am I writing a book every four years? I get one advance, probably never get more than the advance. As soon as the book is published, I know there's mistakes in it. I know I have regrets about it. I can't fix it anymore. It's done. I should be a podcaster. <laughs> so, so that's the truth. Now, uh, the graceful story is that, uh, and th this part is serious, John. I, I have been blessed. I am extremely fortunate. So with my work at Apple, I became very visible. And so lots of people, they may not know me, but they know of me, which arguably is just as good, if not better, because the people who know me know all my flaws, but the people who know of me think I'm perfect, right? So, so basically, because a lot of people know of me, I have the entree to a lot of remarkable people that most people wouldn't have that entree. And, and so... I feel like there's these concentric, or not concentric, there's circles, there's a Venn diagram. So one circle is who can get to these people. The second circle is who has enough experience to know what really to ask them. And the third circle is who has the balls to ask them what they should ask them. And when you draw those three circles, I'm one of the few people in the middle. And so I, I kind of feel like I have this moral obligation to tap all this wisdom and inspiration from people and make it more widespread. So that's the graceful answer. Oh, 
good. Well, thank you. Now let's jump in because let's because uh, you're doing us a favor, doing me a favor by coming on here. So let's talk about Think Remarkable, your brand new book. So and it's it's a very practical and tactical book, and you talk about something which gets bandied about a lot, but I don't know that we define it. So, guy, what does the word growth mindset mean to you, or how do you? Yeah. So, listen, I believe that you can explain life with three conventions, three techniques, three tools. One is alliteration. Another is tricolons. And another is two-by-two matrices. Actually, there's a fourth, the top ten list. Okay. (laughs) So, with those things, you can do everything. So, for me, um, I read... Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, in early 2000s, and it it was a life changer for me because it told me that, you know, people with fixed mindsets who don't believe they can grow and learn and do new things, they're kind of stuck. It's suboptimal. Whereas people with growth mindsets, they take on new things, they learn new things. Now, this doesn't mean that guarantees you success. It also doesn't certainly guarantee you that it's going to be easy. But you're growing as opposed to failing. And so I, I truly embrace that. And you know, one of the most obvious manifestations of that is I started ice hockey at 44 and surfing at 60. Which, let's just say it's a little late in either case. So I, I first, you know, I, I came very aware of the growth mindset with Carol Dweck. And then I learned about the grit mindset from Angela Duckworth. Yes. And then I learned about the growth mindset, uh, excuse me, the grace mindset. So the book is divided into three pieces, growth, grit, and grace. Now, John, John, seriously, it's hard enough to get a tricolon with alliteration, but how many people have ever gotten a tricolon alliteration with the first two letters of each word? See? No, that's good. That's good. And uh, I love it. So um, Grit, Angela Duckworth has pioneered that, a good colleague of mine, uh, Sharon um, Paulson Hoffman has uh, hired, um, written extensively about it, the grit factor. So what does grit mean for you? You've been a start. You work for large companies and you've worked in startups. So, and uh, what does it mean to you? How do you see it manifest? Well, I think grit means that you keep showing up. Uh, the the old yarn about ninety percent of success is showing up. <laughs> That's kind of true. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't show up every day. So it's yeah. about showing up, and it's about continuing when you have doubts. It's about opening yourself up for vulnerability. Vulner, vulnerability comes from a Latin word meaning vulnus, and that means wound. So it, it means that you're willing to be wounded. And Angela Duckworth is a friend of mine. So is Carol Dweck. And they, you know, the, the two of them have just shaped my life. And listen, I, I as I said, I consider myself very fortunate um, you know, my, my health and all that and being in the right place at the right time. But even if you're in the right place at the right time, that doesn't mean that life comes to you on a silver platter. You still got to show up and work. And there are a lot of people smarter than me. There's some people who work harder than me, but there are not too many people who can do both. <laughs> That's good. I like I like that, and grit is so important. And you know, a counterpart to that is resilience. And in your podcast and the book, um, um, uh, do you is there an example or a person of resilience that stands out to you, guy? Or um, oh well, you know, my, my podcast is called Remarkable People. It's not called Rich People or Famous People or Lucky People. It's called Remarkable People, and yeah. Y- Many people will have heard of my guests like Jane Goodall, Stacey Abrams, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Angela Duckworth, Carol Dweck. But the the ones that show resilience are the ones you probably never heard of. And and a, a few of them have extensive prison records. They grew up in the projects. 
uh, their parents were both crack addicts, stealing from them. And and you see what you overcame, or excuse me, you see what they overcame to get where they are. A and truly, it just humbles you. I mean, you know, if if you're waking up and you're saying, oh, man, like, it's so hard getting into Ivy League schools as an Asian American nowadays. There's reverse discrimination. Well, let me get my violin out for you because there are people in my book who at 16, they're sentenced to 44 years for a murder they didn't commit. After 22 years, they're released. And now they're not angry and bitter and they're certainly not back in jail, but he's made a life for himself as an artist, his name is uh, Halim Flowers. And if you're familiar with art, he could be the next Jean-Michel Basquat. So now, like to me, that's resilience, that's grit. You know, like, you know, well, what did you do for the first 22 years of your life? Oh, I went to private school, then I went to Ivy League. And during the summer, I was an intern for Goldman Sachs. And then I started at McKinsey. I've, I've really had a really tough life. Yeah, right. not compared to Halim Flowers, you haven't. No, that's, that's a wonderful story. And, and I like that. Um, so much of, tra uh, of resilience is that factor of getting knocked down, but coming back. But you're coming in, as uh, Eileen McDard has taught me and taught her before, so many people, it's coming through transformation. And you talk about the artist, uh, the former convict artist who put up with such adversity and came out and truly flowered, <laughs> should I say, in a wonderful, graceful manner. I will add. Yes, Resilience very much great. so. Great. You 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 mark my words. You will hear the name Halim Flowers as an artist. I guarantee you that. Not not that I'm an art connoisseur, but I mean I could just. There's some people you can just tell that they're destined for great things. Great. Now you have a, a great way of words, and so when your chapter you have a a chapter called <clears throat> "Get Beyond Eureka." So yeah. what does that mean? Okay. Um, you know, the the sort of fable or fantasy of tech entrepreneurship and innovation is, you know, I don't know, if you're Isaac Newton, you're sitting under an apple tree and the apple falls on your head and you discover gravity or, you know, I don't know, Steve and Waz are in their garage and they figure out, oh, we should make a personal computer. Mark Zuckerberg says, I can't get any dates. Let's make this thing called Facebook so we can find women on, you know, the campus. And the way, especially these movies portray it, it's like, bam, you get this great idea. Lightning strikes. And after that, it's easy. Okay. And i tell you something. My experience is it's quite the opposite, that ideas are easy, but implementation is really hard. Right. And you, you try to build a Facebook or an Apple uh, or, you know, you, you try to be Andrew Zimmern and make all these restaurants and all these videos and bizarre food series and all that. It's very, very hard. I think that's a very valuable lesson that you need to go beyond Eureka. You're like, Eureka, why don't I do a TV show where I go all over the world eating food that most Americans would just like not even touch, right? Like, I don't know, boiled guinea pig and I don't know, you know, like salted sharks in Iceland. Well, why don't I make that? It's like, oh, brilliant idea, Andrew. That's going to have a lot of B-roll, a lot of great, you know, human interest stories. Okay, great idea, Andrew. Now make the series. <laughs> That's right. a whole different thing, baby. Well, yeah, and, and we've touched on grit and how that you need the grit, but there's something in which I think we sometimes entrepreneurs or startup people forget because it's maybe not right in their uh, sweet spot, but you call it selling your dreams. Sell, sell, sell. So too often selling has a negative connotation. So when you hear yeah. that, what do you say? <laughs> well, I say that when you come right down to it, <laughs> okay, in entrepreneurial organizations, there's only two functions, <laughs> okay? So you better get with it. Number one function is you make stuff. Second function is you sell stuff. 
that's it. <laughs> Everything else is overhead. So you got to make something or sell something. And it's, I think, kind of unlikely that in one person you can embody both skills. Steve Jobs could sell. He couldn't really make. Waz yeah. could make. He couldn't really sell. And, and I think that's why it's always two guys in a garage, two gals in a garage, or a guy and a gal in a garage. And, you know, the, the, I think the solo entrepreneur, this, you know, just f- towering figurehead that inspires everybody and knows it all. That's a myth. It's a myth. Absolutely. So many great companies. It, it, it's it's one thing to build a business, another thing to operate it. And you got to keep selling along the way. So yeah. and I, I and, tell people, John, the if you remember nothing else, people from this this uh, live session, you remember one phrase. OK, if you want to be remarkable, just remember this one phrase. Sales fixes everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you got to yeah. know. I, I, that brings back a story from my marketing communication days. There was a gentleman who the, uh, the company said, it all be, nothing happens without the sale. <laughs> so sell, sell, sell. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, and, and drilling down on the sell, sell portion, I, my philosophy, and I'm sure you do too, selling is persuasion. So I think if you're not selling something, you don't have any values. You don't have anything you believe in. <laughs> What's your take on that, guys? So, yeah, also, if you're not selling something, your lips are not moving. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you have, we're talking about two people. So uh, let's get back to the Hewlett uh, and Packard model, you, which calls managing by walking around. They pioneered yes. that. So you have a, a step further to the 21st century. What does it yes, mean to yes. manage well, by zooming around? So, Yeah, well, first of all, just in the in this in the in the spirit of intellectual honesty, let me tell you that the person who gave me that concept is Tom Peters, the one and only Tom Peters. So I don't want to appropriate his intellectual property. He is a friend of mine, and it would be disrespectful to do that. And I also believe in karma, so I don't want to <laughs> steal anything from Tom Peters. Um, so you know what, a lot, lot of people condemn zoom and and this kind of interaction because uh, you can't make eye contact you can't read the room you know there's obviously there are disadvantages but uh, i mean i suppose that when people start first started using the telephone and you know not going over every sunday night for dinner and use the phone to catch up People were saying, you know, the telephone is going to ruin society. You're not making eye contact. You're not seeing them. You're not hugging them. You're not touching them. You know, this is the end of the world. And now we're like one step removed with Zoom and all that. But I tell you something, these are tools. And someone who uses Zoom well can manage to wander around and have a terrific impact. And I would say if, if you're running a you know multinational conglomerate, okay, yes, maybe you go to your your um, EMEA offices twice a year because you want to like you know be close to them and all that. But properly using Zoom, you can be there a lot more often. And yes, it's not as intense, but I tell you something, the frequency can be a lot higher. So I would not blame the tool. I would just learn how to use the tool. Well, good. Now we've touched on the growth, the grit and, we, and grace. So what is, since the theme of my show is grace under pressure, what does grace mean to you? And is there a story about grace that, uh, from a yeah. person that you've interviewed? Okay, I don't want people to think I'm obsessed with tricolons, but here's another one for you. <laughs> I believe that in the first third of your life, you are underpaid. Yeah. In the second third of your life, you're overpaid. And in the third third of your life, you pay back. And grace is paying back. Grace is the realization that you are fortunate, that somebody probably opened that door for you. And now you have to leave that door open or make it even bigger. 
that there's a karmic scoreboard. And when I was in school, uh, in college, my father pulled me aside and said, you know, learn something called noblesse oblige, which is the obligations of the nobility. I, I happen to have come to not like that term because, I don't know, the word noble just strikes me wrong. It's, you know, it's like, yeah, if you're Prince Harry or King Charles or Queen Elizabeth or maybe even Meghan Markle, um, your nobility. So, you know, you got to take care of the peons. And I, I think that attitude sucks. But anyway, so <laughs> I, I have a new term and my term is success oblige, which is when you are successful. You know, it, a lot of it is luck. Don't get me wrong. A lot of it is luck. A lot of it is a lot of people helped you and worked for you, worked with you. So don't believe it's just because you're such an amazing person, right? So when you have this humility, I think the flip side of that is you realize, you know what? A lot of people helped me. Now it's my turn to pay back. I have an obligation to society to leave it a better place to make a difference. And that's the third of my life that I'm in right now. That's great. That's a lovely, lovely, that's a story of grace. I love that. Is there a, a role model or role models that have inspired you in this pursuit of grace or giving back? Well, I would say now this is from the outside looking in because I don't, you know, I'm not exactly their best friend, but I would say Jimmy Carter personifies grace. Uh, I would say, I hate to admit this, but I think maybe even Bill Gates, you know, exhibits grace with, with the, what the work he's doing with his foundation. Although getting divorced didn't exactly help that case for me. But anyway, and then, uh, I, but now, aside from all of that, I would say the best example I know of grace is Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall is an extremely gracious woman. I've never met anybody as gracious. She's kind to me. She's She has, if you knew the schedule that Jane Goodall has for travel all the time. And listen, when Jane Goodall travels, she's on every second. It's not like, oh, she just makes a one hour keynote and then she's hanging out in the green room or she's hanging out in the restaurant and, you know, she's working out in the fitness center and she's doing yoga and she's getting massages. Jane Goodall is on 24 by seven. And, and yet, you know, I, I, I asked her to shoot a video for me for something for my book where I'm making a course for Canva called How to Be Remarkable. And the course is for teachers and students for free. This is a course on how to be remarkable. And of course, I wanted just a little vignette from Jane. So I, I ask her and I, I see, see her, her people. Her people come right back and say, Jane is so busy, she cannot do it. I say, okay, I understand. Of all people in the world, I understand that. The next day I get an email from Jane. Oh yeah, guy, no problem. I'll do it. <laughs> and, well, you win. So now I've been asking her and, you know, I'm trying to get it done. And we got on the phone with her, but the, the connection in Tanzania or wherever she is, is so bad. She couldn't do it. She says, okay, don't worry. I said, well, just record it by yourself without us and then just send us the file. Right. Because that's no connections issues there. And then just, this morning, I get an email from her. So, you know, and she says, guy, I was ready to record it. I'm in, I don't know, Tanzania. And I was ready to do it. But next to my hut is another hut. And they're, they're drilling for water. So there's so much noise. I cannot record a video. <laughs> so hopefully they'll find water. And then I can do your video for you. But I hope you don't think I forgot or I didn't want to do that. And I mean... This is Jane freaking Goodall telling me this, right? Like, pinch me, pinch me. Yeah. Right. And, you know, that uh, obviously it's a woman of grace. Her life is one of that, or primatologist and popularized um, a study of AIDS and brought it to the world. And obviously a big time famous person, but doesn't act like it. And then she calls you back. Oh, I hope I'm, I'm sorry. I can't do it right now. <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> we, we take what we get. And that's such an example. And I've had moments of that with people who my 
have the highest respect will come back and apologize to me for no need because they didn't make a deadline or something. So, and that's a good reminder for, at least for me to get off my high horse. Uh, right. <laughs> So, great. I mean, so, you know, uh, I, I gotta, I, I completely agree with you, John. Like, what's going through my head is, if Jane Goodall can do this in Tanzania with them drilling for water next door with lousy connection, guy, you sure as hell can do that sitting in California, sitting on AT and T fiber, one megabit up, one megabit down. So, guy, you know, like, man up and do it. <laughs> Right. And yeah, <laughs> when I encounter th little things like that, I always go, first world problems. <laughs> so these are inconveniences. <laughs> so so um, what's a takeaway message you want people to get from either from your new book, Think Remarkable? I think so. Well, the takeaway message I want people to get is that. You know, first of all, I don't I this is what I don't want them to think this book is about. This book is not about self-help, you know, this kind of like positive psychology, these like, you know, gurus leading you in these weekend retreats at the Ritz Carlton where for five thousand dollars in two days, I'm gonna teach you how to be remarkable. Okay. They will never, ever, ever be seminars like that from me. But what I figured out after interviewing 200, 250 remarkable people, and I mean remarkable people, not rich people, famous people, remarkable people who have made a difference. What I figured out is, you know what? I mean, it is about growth, grit, and grace, and it is about paying back society. And I also tell you that the reason why we consider these people remarkable is not because they woke up one day and they said, from now on, I'm going to position myself as remarkable. I'm going to give speeches. I'm going to write white papers. I'm going to do vision statements. I'm going to have a PR firm position me as remarkable. The way it works is you make the world a better place. It can be a computer. It can be discovering primatology. It can be one student in one classroom. It can be yourself. It can be a team. It can be one stream in your neighborhood that you cleaned up, right? When you make a difference, the logical sequence of events is you use growth grit to make a difference. You make the world a better place. And then guess what? People will consider you remarkable. It's not because you tell people you're remarkable. It's because you did something remarkable. I guarantee you, Steve Jobs and Jane Goodall never got up in the morning and said, yeah, today I'm going to prove that I'm remarkable. Right. Oh, that's a powerful. I love that. And what a great note. Um, we're coming to the end of our show. You've already told us a story about grace, uh, unless you want to add something. But how can people find you, uh, Guy? So... Uh, it's hard not to find me. I'm kind of like pollution or plastics in the ocean. Um, oh, I think you're better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, as far as finding the book, <laughs> it'll be in every possible online bookstore and analog bookstore. You, you just search for Think Remarkable. That's, yeah, there's not a lot of other things named Think Remarkable. So, you, you know... I optimize SEO, but anyway, um, well, I have a website called GuyKawasaki.com. On right. social media, I'm most active on LinkedIn. But right. if people want to interact with me on LinkedIn I, or, or really anywhere on social media, I just want them to understand that I, I'm not trying to get more friends and get more followers and monetize my following and all that. You know, at this stage in life, I just want to leave the world a better place. And now, if that means saying things you don't like or agree with, <laughs> don't follow me because <laughs> I I am pulling no punches. I am too freaking old to pull punches anymore. Well, Guy, I will say you are making the world a better place. I have known you for decades, known your work, and um, it is an honor for me to speak to you today. Aww. And You are one who shows us grace, so I'm grateful. And with that, we'll go out. So. All right. Thank you so much, John, for having me. It's been a pleasure.